In this presentation, I'm going to offer you a couple of thoughts on aspects of designing eye movement studies. And these thoughts are based upon the 20 or so years of research I've done on novice programmers. And what I've studied in those 20 years can be summarized in one question. What code-related skills precede code writing? Before I go any further, I should be careful to say that I'm talking about students who've done one semester of programming. And the answer the ability to write code is related to two prerequisite skills. One of those is code tracing and what I mean by that is the student is given a piece of code, they're given some initial values for variables and they then track the changes of variable values as the code is executed, possibly on a piece of paper, and then they can tell you what values are in the variables after the code has stopped. The other skill, code explanation, is a question where you present the student with a piece of code and then you say to them, what does this code do? And you're not looking for a line-by-line -line explanation, you're just looking for a summary of the overall purpose of the code. And if students have those two skills at the end of the first semester, it seems that they can write code of similar complexity. Now, to offer you some evidence for that, I'll present one piece of evidence from a paper I co-authored in 2009. What you see on the horizontal axis of this graph is how students performed on the code tracing questions and the code explanation questions in the exam the students did at the end of their first semester. And what you see on the left-hand axis is the students' performance on the code writing questions in that same exam that the students did at the end of their first semester. And then you'll see that I've fitted a line through those data points. An R squared value of 0.66 is usually regarded as a pretty good fit when you're talking about uh, an experiment that involves people. If you're not comfortable with accepting that that is a good R squared, a good fit to the line, let me offer you this more intuitive justification. That box contains no data points. So in other words, students who did poorly on both tracing and explaining, none of those students did well on code writing. And equally, students who did well on both tracing and explaining, none of those students did poorly on writing. The first point I want to make with respect to eye tracking studies is related to tracing, and here it is. I don't think there's a lot of point in doing eye movement studies on students who cannot trace code. To study the eye movements of such students is a bit like studying the swimming style of a drowning person. The student's just overwhelmed. There's no real cognitive process going on. There's just panic. That's what you'll find in the eye movement data, panic. So I suggest that when you get a group of students who are volunteering for your eye movement study, before you start doing the eye scanning, you give them some tracing questions, possibly on a piece of paper, and if they tend to get the questions wrong, you say to them, thank you very much, we really appreciate that you volunteered, but you're not the type of student we're looking for. The other point I'll make on the basis of this graph is to do with explanation questions. So these are the ones where you will collect eye movement data. You'll give them a piece of code and then ask them to tell you what the code is doing and you record their eye movements as they try to figure that out. To make my point, I'm going to introduce an explanation question. Here's the first bit of the code. If y1 is less than y2, swap the values in y1 and y2. I didn't want the students to focus on the swapping part of this code, so I gave them this portion as pseudocode so that their focus is really more on the, the if statement. And if I asked you for an explanation of that question, you might offer up something like this. It rearranges the values in necessary so that the smallest value is in Y2. Then I give you this piece of code, which is the same as before, but now instead of Y1 and Y2, it's the variables Y2 and Y3. And your explanation for both pieces of code, it rearranges the values in necessary so that the smallest value is in Y3. The smallest value, wherever it was in those three variables to start with, has bubbled its way to be in Y3. And I've just hinted as to what I'm going to, about to do. If I copy that first if statement and now ask you what the code does, a very sophisticated answer might be it's a bubble sort on the three variables. I actually will accept it sorts the values. I don't even mind if you mention that it sorts it from highest to lowest or lowest to highest, as long as you say something about it sorts the values. Now, I gave this question to my students one semester, halfway through the semester in the mid-semester exam, so about six weeks in, and in that test, half of my students got that question wrong. At another university, 
we put this question in their exam paper at the end of the semester and two-thirds of the students got it wrong there. So this is not a trivial piece of code. Before I make my point about cloud explanation and eye scanning, I need to introduce one more idea, and that is that there are actually two ways that students go about answering these explanation questions. One of them is what I call the deductive approach, and we just did the deductive approach. Just read through the code and just think about the code as you do that, and you come up with the answer. But there's quite a few students who don't do that. But they do it by what I call the inductive approach. What they do is they plug some initial values into the variables and then they manually execute the code, trace it. And then based upon the input-output behavior of the code, they offer up an explanation. Here's an example of one subject we studied, Donald. And he chose the values 1, 2, and 3 as his initial values. Then he carried out a perfectly correct trace of the code so that when the code finished, the values were 3, 2, 1. So he went from initial values of 1, 2, 3 to the values 3, 2, 1. And on the basis of that trace, Donald concluded that the purpose of the code was to reverse the values to y1, y2, y3. The first time I saw this sort of answer, I was astonished. If that was what the code was doing, reversing the values, why would there be if statements in the code? And furthermore, why would we worry at all about what was in Y2? Wouldn't we just swap Y1 and Y3? But some students offer up that sort of explanation. And for those sort of students like Donald, there is little or no abstraction beyond the code itself. They need to think about code in terms of concrete values. They might go on to learn to reason about code in an abstract way, but at this stage of their development, they only can think about code in terms of concrete values. If you've puzzled over some of the bizarre behaviors you see in your students, this explains it. For example, the practice known as shotgun debugging in Wikipedia, that is a process of making relatively undirected changes to software in the hope that a bug will be perturbed out of existence. You've probably seen first semester students attempting to do exactly that. And if they are a student, like Donald, who cannot abstract from code, who reasoned by tracing specific values, that's really the only approach you've got to debugging code. So, those are the two approaches students can use. And the point I'm going to make is, in an eye tracking study, I don't think you really want to study the inductive students. My first suggestion is that you screen out those students. If you want to keep those students in your data, at the very least, separate these two types of student behaviors into two separate sets of data and analyze them separately. Finally, the paper contains six explanation questions which I'd be very curious to see eye scanning studies for and I'm hoping that one of you will do such a study. I don't have time to present all of them in this presentation so let me present just one of them. So here is a piece of code, sum all values in an array. That's what the code does, and so we have a variable in, in which we'll be collecting the sum. It's called z because if we called it sum, it would be giving the answer away. And we have a for loop, and each time around the for loop, we add another element of the array into the variable collecting the sum. And when I gave that code to my students at the end of their first semester, 83% of them answered correctly that it was summing the values. But then I gave the students a second question with almost the same code. This second question only summed the positive values in the array. Actually added just that one line. 13% of the students got the first one right but got the second one wrong. In fact, they tended to give the same answer to both. How can a student read all of those lines and answer correctly that it sums all the values and then somehow ignored that one line of code? And eventually I realized that I was framing the question in my mind the wrong way. When answering that question, 13% of the students were not reading all the code. What I think was going on is 13% of my students were only really reading two lines of code. Those two. The print statement told them it was printing out the value in Z, and, and there's this other line of code where Z is modified. And on the basis of those two lines, they made a plausible guess as to what the code does. So if I gave you the code that summed all the values, and you only read those two lines... Yes, you'd come up with the correct answer, even though you only read two lines. And if I gave you all this, but you only read those two lines, you would come up with the same answer. So that's what I think those 13% of the students were doing, focusing on only those two lines. And I would love to see an eye scanning data to see if my explanation is correct. There's a summary of the points I've made. I'll just leave that there and say nothing more about it for now.